Hey guys, let's talk about hypersensitive disorders and anaphylaxis. So first let's talk about what it is. Um, so what um, hypersensitive disorders uh, is, um, or are, I should say, because it's a group of disorders, is, you know, it's another one of those allergic responses. And this kind of encases a lot of stuff. So <clears throat> if you remember where we talked about allergic rhinitis, allergic rhinitis is a type of hypersensitivity disorder. So think of, when you read, like, see the words hypersensitive, just think of someone overreacting. So I always um, kind of, this is a joke, but you to think of like your most sensitive friend or family member like that's what a hypersensitivity disorder is they take everything you say personally and like you can't do anything right no matter what they always feel like their feelings are getting hurt and that is what a hypersensitivity disorder is in your body except it's not about feelings it's just about this immune response so pretty much it's your body like every time something comes in your body it's like oh no it's an invader it's an invader it's an invader and like constantly fighting um and so um it's overreacting to something that probably everything wasn't harmful. And sometimes it's even like, it's reacting to something that's harmful, but it's overreacting. Like it's kind of going crazy with it and causing problems other uh, elsewhere in the body. So um, there's lots of different ways that reactions can show up. You can have a skin reaction like a rash. Um, you can have an airway reaction or a respiratory reaction like allergic rhinitis or anaphylaxis where the throat closes. Um, and then you can also have swelling like, you know, like um, some people get angioedema and other swelling to that specific area where the allergen has been, ex um, has been exp the exposure happened. So most of ex uh, diagnosing hypersensitivity disorders is done by symptoms. So in other words, someone comes in and says, hey, I can't talk, like you know, my mouth swelling or I have this rash or something else is going on. Um, but we can also test blood for signs of immune reactions. We can get a CBC and look for certain cells that show that the immune system is overreacting. Um, <clears throat> most, what the most common test that people have is what's called allergy skin testing. And so what they do with this is, is that they pretty much either prick the skin or um, topically on the skin, put a bunch of allergens and then see what your body reacts to. Um, we need to make sure that if they're going to get this test, that they're off all steroids, allergy medications, because I'm trying to see if you're going to react. So if you're taking medications that stop you from reacting, it's going to, I'm not going to be able to tell what your actual reaction is. So again, it's kind of like that whole thought of like, doing the culture after giving the antibiotics. If I do that, I don't actually necessarily know how bad the growth is and um, what is growing because maybe that um, antibiotic might blur those results. So as a whole allergy skin testing, no other, we wanna make sure they're off their meds for a few days so that we can really see how they're gonna react. Um, and then um, this patient that we usually, they have to do it in an office and we have to, they have to stay around for a while because maybe they might have a little bit of delayed reaction. Um, we definitely don't want their throat closing or any sort of um, really negative response. So um, it has to be done under safe conditions. But this will allow us to later, if we can identify what they're allergic to, we can help them to avoid it. And then we can also help to, um, uh, we call it, um, uh, to, by doing, we're gonna talk about in a little bit, what's called immunotherapy, which is where you can help target some of those things that they're allergic to and maybe decrease their sensitivity to them. So um, like I said, it varies on what it looks like. It depends on the reaction of the person, but you can have hives or a skin rash. You can have swelling, difficulty breathing. Um, itchiness, watery, um, itchy eyes, like it's just going to depend, um, it can be from mild to severe, moderate, you know, there's a variety of things. You can have all of these things. Um, usually for general like hypersensitivity disorder, if it's just a local reaction, we might do something like calamine lotion or um, diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl, um, you know, like an antihistamine to help to decrease that reaction. Um, but usually we just do something local to the point. Um, you know, we need to tell the patient about um, taking medication prior if we know what they're allergic to, maybe after getting that allergy testing. And then I brought up this immunotherapy. And so pretty much what that is, it's where they, they find out what you're allergic to and they mix it all up in a little vial and they start giving you little doses of it. They start with a really tiny dose and slowly, um, you know, start to build up to that. And that's so how you can, um, you know, slowly, like if you're allergic to something and you're something you can't avoid that it can make life um, day 
day-to-day life more manageable. So like some people will do it, but they're like, uh, like, well, I'm allergic to cats, but I married someone who has cats and, you know, it's got, got to make this work. So, you know, they'll go and they can get immunotherapy, um, to kind of desensitize them. Now, this is a long process. It can take over a year and sometimes it doesn't work. It's not a guarantee. So, um, it's just something that you can possibly try to do to make it. So at least even if you are reacting, you're not reacting as severely. Um, but it's, it is dangerous in the sense that they're pretty much giving you something knowing you're going to react. And so these patients need like EpiPen teaching and they need to know how to uh, manage that if there's a problem. Um, so they, uh, this patients also commonly need regular allergy medications to suppress the allergy response. So remember, this is all an overreaction. So we talked about like, you know, there's two kind of ways that we medicate patients. We either do stuff to prevent, to say, hey, stop reacting so much. Um, and then we also give medications to treat. So the allergy medications can help to suppress so I'm not reacting so much. It's gonna help decrease some of that, like, oh, I gotta fight stuff, I gotta fix this. You know, it's gonna kind of decrease that freak out response that your body's having. So now let's transition to talking about anaphylaxis. So anaphylaxis is a life-threatening hypersensitivity reaction. This is where the airway starts swelling to the point where it can actually lead to airway closure. Um, and the scary thing about anaphylaxis is that usually it doesn't happen until your second exposure. So let's say like my son was younger, we used to think he was allergic to peanut butter. Um, and so the first time he had peanut butter, no problem. But then the second time he started kind of breaking out and like a uh, thing all over his face. And so why that happens is the first time, you know, sometimes these allergens kind of surprise the body and the body's like, whoa, 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 I don't like that. I don't know. I don't, I don't want that ever again. So it starts building defenses. It kind of like it, it's preparing for war. So it's like when it comes back next time, I'm fighting that thing. So the next time that that thing, that allergen gets introduced into the body, the body's like, hurrah, here's my fight. And so to the point where sometimes they can go into anaphylaxis. And that's why, you know, they say you have to be super careful. Like, you know, um, sometimes with like, if I had an allergy to peanuts and then, um, and by the way, my son's not allergic to peanuts, thank goodness, because peanuts are life um, or peanut butter is at least. But um, let's say I had an allergy to peanuts, that would give my child a really high chance of them having allergy to peanuts. I would need to be extra careful with that. Um, anaphylaxis can lead to cardiovascular or part and blood problems like shock. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. Anaphylaxis is serious business. Um, I always uh, love the story, you know, my husband always tells us that he knew someone who was so allergic to peanuts that they couldn't even go into Chick-fil-A because of the oil, like the smell of the oil would, um, they'd react just from the smell. Um, so some people are super re um, reactive to this stuff. Um, <clears throat> most people that have anaphylaxis are, they're going to complain of, um, you know, dyspnea, trouble breathing. They're going to have trouble like finding words, or maybe you can't even talk, um, wheezing, um, tachycardia. Um, they're going to have confusion and anxiety a lot of the time and feel very faint. And then when it progresses to shock, that's where the low blood pressure comes in plus all these symptoms. So they start to go into kind of like a, a phase where, where their body's like, I can't manage this. Cause pretty much what happens is that like when your airway and stuff starts to close, you can't breathe, your fight or flight comes in. Cause your body's like, oh my God, I'm dying. I've got to fix this. It causes that tachycardia, that, um, what do you call them? Uh, that sense of anxiety and panic and stuff like that can set in. Cause also you're not breathing. Um, and eventually what happens is, is that, um, your body is like trying to, it's ready to fight. So it opens all of its doors and it does what's called vasodilation. It opens all the blood vessels and it just says, I need all my guys to come fight this thing. And so your blood pressure drops drastically. And that's where you kind of get into that shock phase. And most of the time these come hand in hand. You go from anal you can go from anaphylaxis into shock pretty quickly, which is why when we start seeing these symptoms, we want to start treating this immediately. So um, my number one priority is to get that airway open for anaphylaxis. And so the first drug that I need to use is epinephrine. All these other drugs are great probably going to need to use them. But first and foremost, I always have to start with the epinephrine because the epinephrine is going to help to open that airway so that all these other medications can work. Um, they're going to probably need a bronchodilator like albuterol to help to decrease some of that airway constriction that I'm having. Um, then I need to start loading them up with stuff to decrease the allergic response, corticosteroids, um, diphenhydramine, which is an um, anti-histamine. Um, 
uh, that I mentioned that their blood pressure is going to be low and they're having that vasodilation. And so I'm going to probably need to give them fluids to help to increase their blood pressure if their blood pressure is low. Um, oxygen, if their oxygen levels are low a lot. Most people with anaphylaxis need some sort of oxygen treatment. If not, sometimes they even have to have that breathing tube in to help support them. And then put their head of bed up to support their airway and their breathing. So overall, not just for anaphylaxis, but for all hypersensitivity disorders, my role is to get a thorough history. I want to not only know their history, but I want to know the history of their family, because a lot of times that's going to affect or um, have a change into how it's going to, um, how they might react to certain substances and other things. I want to monitor their respiratory status closely and always look for complications, make sure that, you know, like I said, some people, they may not react a first time, but they may react a second time to something. So always be looking for those times when they're going to be high risk for um, having a reaction or a problem. Um, I want to teach the patient to avoid things that are triggering them, you know, keep a diary and other things of things that are bothering them, or if they got the allergy testing, um, skin testing and stuff like that to avoid those things when possible. I want to um, teach them about prevention, so how to take their um, medications prior to exposure to their allergen and also regularly take them to prevent complications. They need to know when to seek help. When is a sign that, hey, this is expected and when is a sign like, hey, I need to go get help. We'll talk a little bit about that with the EpiPen teaching here on the next slide. As a whole, if they're ever, you know, think of like that serious anaphylaxis. If they're ever like something's getting worse, they can't breathe. Um, th there's definitely like there's swelling starting to happen around their airway. They need to seek help immediately. Cause even if it doesn't seem that bad, like, oh, my lips are just swollen or my tongue's a little swollen. You'd be amazed at how quickly that that can progress and lead to the point where they can't breathe. So anything affecting their airway, they definitely need to get looked at ASAP. Um, and training needs to happen for not only just the client, but their family too, because sometimes these can progress rapidly and sometimes to the point where um, your know, family has to be the one to rescue that patient. So um, patients that get allergy um, testing are going to need to know, like they're going to have EpiPens nearby. Um, people that get immunotherapy are going to be given their own EpiPens. And people that have any sort of anaphylactic reactions are going to be prescribed an EpiPen. So it's important to know what we teach these patients. I'm going to teach them to always keep it on them no matter what. It's something, it's not like, hey, well, I don't think that I'll come into contact with my allergen here. That's probably just when you will. <laughs> you know, just jinxed yourself. Um, so always keep carried on you no matter what. Um, when you need to inject it, you inject it in the mid thigh. And um, it's important to know that you may need repeated doses. So in other words, you may give it and then it's going to, it's like a band-aid for, um, it's going to help open stuff up temporarily. But um, it doesn't mean like your body's still trying to fight off whatever that, um, you know, a allergen or whatever over it's overreacting to. So you need to have multiple um, pins, you know, available available, excuse me. Um, after you um, inject yourself, you're not good to go. You need to seek help. You need to call 911 and um, get seen by your doctor, go to the hospital, et cetera, um, in order to uh, make sure that things are going to clear up. You want to seek medical uh, attention. Um, like I mentioned, the family needs to know how to inject in case you pass out before you can inject it. Um, and that, that's also like, um, kids that are in elementary school that have these kind of reactions, like that's why they have school nurses and that their teachers and other people have to be trained to these um, so that they can properly give them in an emergency. And then EpiPens can also have, um, they have pretty tight expiration dates, so they need to know how to find those and need to keep up with them as well. So let's talk about latex allergies as a special topic <clears throat> before we close this. Um, so um, uh, pretty much um, the latex allergy, um, you know, latex is common in a lot of medical supplies. You're going to see um, latex. Um, it, it's not made like it's definitely kind of going a little it's going out of style, but you're still going to find latex in a lot of products. So when you're asking about allergies, you want to ask about latex specifically, because you may ask people, hey, do you have any allergies? And they might say penicillin, et cetera. But a lot of times people don't think latex. I know that sounds strange because you're like, it's called a latex allergy, but sometimes people don't always put um, it all together. So I always want to ask specifically about that. 
Um, and then keep in mind that people that are allergic to latex may also be allergic to certain foods because there's a common like there's um, a latex food syndrome. And um, I think it's a good like, I want to say 30 to 40% of people that have latex allergies are allergic to these foods as well. So um, there's like a cross sensitivity. So um, you, they want to use caution. Here's just a few examples. There's more but like bananas, shellfish, avocado, kiwi, um, they want to watch closely um, and see make sure that they're not going to react to those as well. These patients are going to need to wear a medic alert bracelet so that when um, if they had passed out and weren't able to speak for themselves or someone wasn't able to ask their allergies that people know that they're allergic to latex and um, just like the others they need to carry that EpiPen and get that EpiPen teaching as well as their family so that they can remain safe. So that is um, hypersensitivity disorders altogether. Hope that was helpful. Bye.